And you know what? When I when we finally got married, just into the last <laughs> after I'm 80 years old, almost. Um, I asked him, I said, why didn't you ever ask me to marry you? And he said, I didn't want to leave you a young widow in case he didn't come home. There was just too much happened in the Navy. And that's even before you get to war. Uh, rough weather, and I, I seen men, I heard of men, washed off the side of the ship and never heard from them again. Fires in the hold, and men burnt so bad and no place to run, and they're brought up on deck with a smile on their face, thanks for saving me, but please let me die because the pain is unbearable or a helicopter trying to pick up guys off a raft in the middle of the ocean and the motor fails and they crash down and all die. It, uh, or uh, the forward mounts exploding, killing all that's inside. So it, uh, there, there's perils at sea. And until you've experienced that, uh, you just haven't experienced sea life. Usually by the time you get to your ear end or so, I don't care what branch of the service you're in over there, Army, Navy or what, you're gonna have some time that it's gonna be damn rough. Kind of, you just come over a ridge and there's fighting and you pull back and then you go back and I don't know, it's just, you keep fighting one way or another. I remember a, a comrade that that got shot and he was trying to walk back to the pimping and he died. That's kind of sad. Stand down for all of Vietnam, supposedly no fighting. However, we were up on, as it would be, Hill 241, we were coming down 241 to get to the valley so that we could, helicopters could come and bring us Thanksgiving dinner. and. The only guy killed in Vietnam on Thanksgiving Day 1970 was from our unit. He got killed by a booby trap and he got both legs blown off. So thinking about the Viet Cong again, it wasn't a, a happy time. You know, the 11th Armored, like we had, we had everything. We had the armored infantry. They would ride on the tanks. When it was so cold, I would go out and tell those guys, come on, get in my tank. And they said, no, we got a hole, we're okay. And I did that three times. And finally, I said, okay, but I'm afraid you'll be froze in the morning. And two of them were. They were froze to death. And it wasn't just so bad that it was there. But then when I called that in and they came up with a, with a truck, one took the hand, one took the feed and threw it up in there, just like they were throwing in cordwood. It was just like they're brothers to me, you know. We lost a bit of combat. A lot of people don't think we thought of, you know, the guys that survived, but that was rough. Go out there and carry them guys in. You ever carry some man's head in there and nothing fast to it? I did that a few times too, that's rough. Yeah, that's probably the roughest part of the service. And uh, these two soldiers, not in my unit. I'd rather that. These two soldiers were chasing him across the mud flats. He'd stolen something or he was a known thief or something. And they went out after him. Everybody said, let him go, let him go. They got out there and they had their combat boots on. And they got stuck in the mud. And they couldn't get out. 
So they called a helicopter to come in with a sling to try to pull them out. By the time he got there, they were in almost to their waist, like a, like a quicksand. They tried to pull them out, and they couldn't. They said, there's no way we can get anything in here. The more we dig, the deeper you go. So they, they sent a corpsman out with morphine. Gave him morphine. And just, the one guy looked back and says, hey, it's just a hell of a way to die. And they drowned when the tide came in. The next day, the demolition man came out and blew their bodies out of the mud. We never did hear who they were, but all we could do was sit and watch. And they. The thing that uh, made me feel really bad was uh, the French people, they were starving, the kids were starving, and they were skin and bone, and they'd come around our campground by the fence, and we would throw our uh, dinner over the top. That was the worst part. While I was over there, uh, our oldest daughter was born when I was in Japan. That is not a fun trip, having a baby born near three, four thousand miles away. It has to be the worst. And the Japanese told uh, the Okinawans that we were like barbarians. We'd rape the women and everything else, so they started to commit suicide. And the hills were, oh, probably 100 feet tall. And they'd jump off of that and commit suicide. And they were just, all of them were committing suicide. But, but I'm just going over the rough part of it. When you're there and you see the helplessness and you're there and you're like, what am I doing here? Um, you become so calloused and hard because if you don't, I mean, I saw guys have nervous breakdowns. A couple guys put a bullet through their head. About a year later, he came home on leave. He says, well, he says, I'm going to Vietnam next, next week. I say, so when I finished basic training and I got home, I wanted to look him up and I couldn't find him anywhere. I finally got a hold of his brother. And he says, nobody told you? I said, no, what happened? He says, Rick committed suicide on his way home. I never got a chance to talk to him about what went on in Vietnam. I never got to see him, you know, and I never got to, you know, um, you don't know what went on in his life, what happened, uh, why did he feel so that he took his life on the way back, you know, after he was done with his service. You know, there, there was something I never, you know, talking to his brother and talking to his dad, they never knew either. I thought to myself, well, you know, and it, bothered, it bothers me to this day, 50 years later, that I don't know what went on in him. You know, I don't know if I could have helped him or not. I know we're, we're good friends. You know, I wish I could have had a chance to talk to him. Fast forward now, it's now, I want to say early 2000s. A phone call one day from the skipper of the submarine. Anglesdorf, yes sir. There's a reunion coming up for the Cutlass. Yes, sir, I know that. You need to be there. 
Yes, sir. These reunions had been going on for years, and I'd never gone. Couldn't. Couldn't deal with my own feelings of grief and guilt, inadequacy. Um, but I went to the Cutlass reunion and discovered that I had shipmates there who had been on the submarine when Bill got washed overboard. And they were in worse shape than I was. Doug, had been carrying for fifty years this feeling of if I hadn't this feelings of guilt, if I hadn't asked Bill to swap watches with him, he wouldn't have been lost. I don't have the courage or the nerve to go to Washington, get to the wall. No, can't do it. Can't do it. Don't want to see names there that uh, were still living when I was there. So. But yeah, it's a war. <laughs> it's a war. It's not pretty. It's not like TV. It's not like TV at all. So.